I don't know. What, what, what? 24th, a fifth quarter. Uh, I don't know. I know I'm, I'm, I've got a very strong, I'm very strong percentage Indian. Oh, very, yeah. A very strong percentage uh, 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 Dutch. Dutch. Yeah. Ne- the, the Netherlands. No, can you speak any of those languages? I can speak. What about speak accents? Can you like fake it to make it? The Netherlands? Yeah. I can fake the Netherlands accent. No, but um, I can speak Afrikaans. I can speak what's left of my Spanish after my major. And, yeah. Because I haven't spoken it in two years. Yeah. Do you, do you know Scotty Soul? He's a, he's a guy, he's from the, uh, South Africa too. And he came over, but he does, uh, he does a lot of the music production for like Chad Blue and like uh-huh. all those rappers. Uh-huh. And he's a funny dude, and he he's yeah he taught me like some Afrikaans, but I totally forgot it was like. Oh, it's, it's a very ugly language, and it's dying as far as it's, it's ugly and it's dying. Really, it's like an endangered species. Jesus Christ! It's I like the dodo. I don't know why people still speak it. I don't like it. It's for me. It's it's, it's, a, it's a symbol of the past when, during apartheid, before we had our freedom. Oh really? People were forced to speak that language. Yeah. Yeah, but language. people were forced to speak English too, right? I mean, <laughs> but 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 English, English is much more pretty. Speak. Argument like that, man. Everybody speaks English. Right? Yeah, everyone speaks English. Yeah. One forced. It just became the norm. Yeah. yeah, but you know, with Korean, maybe Korean is going to be the next language that's going to take over if everything is, if all languages are have to be like demolished for whatever reason. We have to start a new one. Apparently, even though a lot of foreigners can't speak English or Korean like really well, they're okay. always like. Korean is supposed to be one of the easiest and most comprehensible languages in the world. To learn? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, to, to read and to write, yes. Yeah. To read and to write, But yes. just to talk, right? Like, you have to put your own thoughts and ideas, and that's where it kind of gets, like, mm. modeled like jazz, right? Yeah. Can I revise? Do you play jazz? Uh, in my mind, yeah. Oh, okay. If I pretend I have a fake trumpet, I can do pretty good. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, anyways, yeah, let's, let's go on. Let me on. first put my eye drops in. Put your eye drops in. My last sex injury. Uh, I'll just talk in the meantime. So, everyone, welcome to The Artist's Journey. The Artist's Journey is brought to you by Onnit, Onnit Onnit.com. But first, you guys can check out our website, right? Our website, let me show it to you. Yo, yo. Yeah. You can check out our website here. Um, Just artistsjourney.org. You know, I'm trying to update a lot of different things, a lot of different interesting articles around the world. Uh, some interesting things that come up. Have you seen the Metal Gear Five trailer? Uh, no. Oh my God! <laughs> we gotta check this out later on. This is fucking amazing. Do you follow the Metal Gear saga? Is this a video game or is yeah, it a, it's no, a video? No. I mean, okay. I'm if, trying to relax. I know it sounds cliche, but if I had time. Yeah. Well, time is everything, right? Yeah. Well, time is the most important thing. But uh, I think Metal Gear Solid is. The series itself is one of the most, one of the best games ever for a video game. And I think this is, the guy who made this, Hideo Kojima, he's the guy who revolutionized all modern games and stuff. He's the guy who integrated like a real storyline, really mm-hmm. complex characters, um, cinematics, like with like a lot of movie style cinematography into it. He put like uh, real um, composers. Is it a first person shooter? So it's like a third person, but it's, it's like a espionage kind of uh, game. Uh-huh. And uh, Metal Gear Solid Five is the newest one. So, anyways, so we'll, we'll check that out later. And uh, yeah, so <clears throat> there's a lot of um, yeah cool sites, uh, links, and memes, and all that stuff I'm putting on there, so you guys can check it out anytime you want. Yeah. So without further ado, let's start the show. So, hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to The Artist's Journey. I'm your host, Wilfred Lee, as always. And today, I'm with a very special guest, the one and only Raul yeah. Daisel. That's right. The Raul Daisel. How you doing, brother? I'm all right. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Excellent. Yeah, Sunday. Mm-hmm. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Church of Sundays. Uh, yeah, so, uh, let's, let's drink first. He's, he's having cranberry oh. juice. I'm having some uh, delicious pulp <laughs> coconut water. No, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, actually, we're just checking out the, my movie collection over there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, so let's just go into it. What was the... Um, do, you, well, do you remember your favorite childhood movie? 
What was your favorite childhood movie? 101 Dalmatian Spinner, but it changed. That was my first, and then it became really? Watership Down. Watership Down. That was the <laughs> movie with the animals, and the rainforest was being, or the... the, the Isn't that the, Fern Gully? No, 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 that wasn't Fern Gully. It was, it was terrible. Um, oh, no! Yes. It was a controversial story about an environment that was being eradicated by the humans, or something like that. It sounds like... Avatar. Oh, it was, it was or like water it, it was it was similar to the Animals of Fatherhood, if you remember that. No. Is it? A, is it a cartoon? Yeah, it was a cartoon. But it was quite violent because like the characters would die, mm-hmm. other animals would kill them, and it was quite shocking to me as a as a as a young kid. And then mm. it, uh, my favorite childhood film, eventually became and remains the Land Before Time. <laughs> became and remains the Land Before Time. <laughs> yeah. Like first and the last. You ever seen The Secret of Nim? Secret of Nim. It's like a bunch of um, rats, and it's like a mother, she loses her children and stuff. It's like hardcore ratatouille, but like really dark. Is it a cartoon? Yeah, oh yeah, it's a cartoon. CG cartoon? Or? No, 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 it's like traditional. It's, um, I forget the guy's name, but he was uh, he used to work at Disney, and then he mm-hmm. started working on his own films, and The Secret of Nim is a really, really hardcore animation, and there's a lot of dying in it, and I'm like, holy shit. Isn't there a, a sequel to that that... Was a immense failure. Uh, possibly it says that Secret of Nim too. And uh, Secret. Yes, of I remember this film. I watched it. Yeah. Yeah. With the with the big evil rat guy. Yeah. Fuck yeah. Like. And this used to be kind of a scary film when I saw this. Yeah, and then they made the second one, and that bombed. It was terrible. And I watched a review. A guy who reviews like sequels to unknown cult masterpieces. Yeah. And uh, he reviewed the Secret of Nim Two, and it was apparently terrible. Yeah, actually, you know, you know when you when you used to hear like the Wizard of Oz, like mm-hmm. the Dark Side of Oz, where mm-hmm. you can listen to Pink Floyd. Um, me and my friends were just blazed. We just went to fucking Pluto, and we're like, "Hey, what if we did the same thing with Secret of Nim?" And we used the album uh, Massive Attack Mezzanine. What did you do? Did you just play the beginning of Massive Attack mm-hmm. uh, at the same time with the Secret of Nim? So mm-hmm. when you're listening to it. You can see how well it's like orchestrated, like the beginning and like all these scenes go like exactly in tune. You ever seen the Dark Side of Oz? No. Okay, so like, okay, let's check it out then. The Dark Side of Oz is like, um, there was like this kind of, um, I don't know if you can call it conspiracy theory, but they used to say that the Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd was basically created based on um, the Wizard of Oz. So they they would watch it and then they would make the music in tune with that. So if you watch it together, it goes exactly in in orchestration, in synchronization. Uh huh. Oh, yeah. Right. So let's see. It's pretty long, but we can check it out. Dark side of the dark side of Oz. And then there was like a few other people who were doing different things too. They were doing like um, Nosferatu, like the old black and white one. Oh, with, I love like that. with Kid A <clears throat> from Radiohead. And really stuff. dig it. I prefer the the remake by Werner Herzog. Did you watch that one? No, no. Oh, it's excellent. Made in the 70s. Is that, there was Willem Dafoe in that? No, no, no. That was... Because he uh, just looks like Willem Dafoe. That was a movie suit. about the making of the movie, but, you know, it was still a fantasy film because the pl- guy playing the vampire was a real vampire. That was called oh, really? uh, sh- uh, the Shadow of the Vampire or mm-hmm. something like that. It had John Malkovich in it. It was, it was very well acted. He's, he's great, yeah. too. Yeah, John Malkovich is like one of those guys who's like in his own zone with like Christopher Walken or like mm-hmm. has his own take on things. Maybe it might take a while. It's the ever since they've um, uh, updated the interface of YouTube, the buffering has been slower in Korea. Yeah. I've got the same problem. I just thought it was North Korea's fault. You know, so many different issues going on these days. Oh. Well, I no. just tend not to care about that. <laughs> yeah, it's it's actually getting kind of serious in a way, like the rhetoric's getting more from serious. from CNN, from what I hear. But uh, yeah, but you... as soon as one Korean person gets a little bit worried, then I start to freak. You're out. not American, right? No, no, I'm from uh, okay, yeah. okay. So you're you can, from, you're you can from say the... whatever you want. Uh, right. Yeah, you know, Americans need to be need to be in a constant state of panic, or the. The, the media needs to keep them in a constant state of panic and keep them tuned in so the ratings can go up, you know, yeah, on the news channels. It was, uh, I think that was really something interesting that, like, Marilyn Manson said on um, Bowling from Columbine mm-hmm. when he was talking about it. 
Jesus. That's the old Mayan for the new one. Yeah, and then when they did that film, like, apparently the lion actually ate one of the guys. Are you kidding me? No, like, during that time they were trying to prepare it, and uh, they actually get a lion, like, it was nothing safe at all, and they tried to get it to, you know, war, and it just fucking attacks some guy. Okay, so, you guys can check this out, too, you know, um... Hopefully they're going to put the dark side of Oz in it. I don't know. Oh, so it's actually playing now. It's in the background. It's really faint. But it, you know, the pink dark side of uh, of the moon has like a heartbeat in the beginning. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. I wrote a five thousand word essay on this film. Did you? Yeah. And you didn't know about the dark side of Oz. No. You could have put that in there, and your teacher was like, "Dude, amazing, put it in there." But yeah, this is a. Uh, a really good film, still. So. so this is time to last for the entire film? Yeah, so they said right when the uh, the lion roars, that's when you, you start the album. Mm. And then you can start checking out everything. We won't watch everything, but we'll watch enough to get the idea for it. This is so hippie, you know, it's just so 1970s, eclectic, transcendent psychedelic ideas. Did you watch the uh, new film that came out? Uh, with uh, with James, James Franco? Franco? Yeah. No, not yet. Oh. It's Apparently it's terrible. Apparently it's okay. Apparently it's very good. Sam Rama, I'm not sure. Like, a couple, of, couple of opinions from a couple of my friends. Um, if it's mixed message, that means you just gotta see it, because that means you either Well, I, I want to see it because it's Sam Raimi. Yeah. You know. Let me just skip up a little bit ahead. It would be nice if they could keep the, the audio in, not of the music of the film, but of the uh, of the dialogue. It would be great. Right. So have like you, when she falls, like the, you know the the whole bunch of the songs. But for, have you have you uh, downloaded the? I mean, not say download. Have you <laughs> purchased the Blade Runner OST by Vangelis? Oh yeah. Well, I mean, if you listen to the tracks on there, they they um, they have the dialogue in the music. You know, especially yeah. like the final one. Where uh, Rutger Hauer has his famous speech at the end, but yeah. I've seen things you people would wouldn't possibly believe. And somewhat improvised too. Right? Oh, that was whole chunk was improvised. Yeah. Improvised the entire line. Just like keep rolling, just go with it and stuff. So yeah, um, show another part here. Once they start getting the tornado part, it, it, it gets pretty interesting too. And uh, once the uh... it's so great, right? <laughs> Poor dog. Come on now. Anyways, you guys can check it out. It's The Dark Side of Oz. I'll share it, and you guys can check it out. It's really interesting. I mean, it's uh, if you haven't seen it before, just go with your friends. You know, you don't want to get drunk when you watch this because you, you just won't pay attention. But, you know, just for shits and giggles, it's pretty good. I'm sure there's a download of it, right? I can just oh, absolutely. You can. You said this magic word again, yeah. download it. Yeah. Oops. Because you can't buy this. Yes. You know, this is... Why download it when you can watch it for free on, on YouTube, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's the the best way it's got to be. So uh, uh, while that happens, let me try to... Um, I'll try to let this load in the meantime while we talk. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so, uh, Ro, you're originally from South Africa, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So what's what was it like growing up there and then coming over here? I mean, completely different. Like, what was... 
the, the journey, I guess, for that? Oh, the journey? Um, I guess you're going to have to ask a more specific question. Um, okay, maybe that was a two-parter, right? Yeah. So what, what's life like in South Africa for you? Um, <clears throat> I guess growing up, it was all I knew. Mm-hmm. So there's not much to complain about, right? Oops, yeah. starting. Um, okay. Yeah. And um, then I, you know, started growing up and looking to greener shores mm-hmm. because I always wanted to be a filmmaker from the age of eight. Mm-hmm. So and why at the age of eight? Uh, I guess the films I was watching. Oh, well, when I was four or five, I used to, I used to draw little comic book strips, you know, and make little stories. They were very violent. People always used to dying at their heads chopped off and shit. Mm-hmm. Um, and then um, I saw Pulp Fiction from quite a young age. I saw it when I was right. like seven. Yeah, it was on TV, and I just watched it. Um, Wait, how old are you now? I'm 23. Okay, yeah, yeah. makes sense. And uh, <clears throat> I eventually wanted to tell my own stories, you know. And at about 11, I had this little camcorder. Mm-hmm. And then when I was 12, I made a movie called The, the Evil Emperor or something like that. You know, oh, you remember? Don't with, a, with a buddy, with a buddy of mine, we just watched the Lord of the Rings, um, and we went on a holiday to the countryside. And half the mountain was burnt down, but not like it wasn't an accident. Like they do these routine fires to maintain the the, the, the vegetational growth. I don't know, something like that. Yeah, something like that. And it was interesting. So we filmed myself doing this magic spell to one side of the mountain, and then we just pan the camera this way and we cut in between Mm -hmm. so it looks like I've burnt the mountain down Um, and then we had this angel of light Mm -hmm. called uh, LSR which is uh, not to be confused with DSLR well not to be confused with Aragorn from the Lord of the Rings because LSR is his Alvish name yeah and that was played by my little brother but then we wanted to finish the movie and my little brother couldn't uh, uh, be in it anymore so we got my buddy's friend who's like twice twice as old (laughs) <laughs> to be in it, um, and much darker. Um, and we've just finished it. I don't know where it is now. There's a little. There should be a little cassette at back home, a VHS cassette. So how did you guys come up with that? I mean, like when you saw the mountain, you're like, okay, this is the perfect. I was just like, or... oh my gosh, you know, I obviously inspired by the Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. What if a wizard did that? That was it. How did? What if uh, I film it like this, and then I film it like that, and people think that? That and the, those two spots are the same places, and uh, I could fake it to make it look like some evil magic did that. Yeah. So, uh, was, is there like a like a good, a strong film community in South Africa? Like when you were doing that stuff, because it seems like you were just doing it just b- because you were like motivated to do it after. Is there a strong film community in South Africa? There's a whole bunch of jealous people. That but that's kind of like anywhere, right? Mm, especially so in South Africa. You know? Do you know what crab in a bucket syndrome is? No, but it sounds like a okay. bad case of STDs. All right, okay. Yeah. Well, uh, when you catch crabs on a beach and you put them in a bucket, um, what do the cat crabs try and do? Mm-hmm. Do they stay in the bucket or do they try and climb out? They try and climb out, right? Mm-hmm. Normally, one makes it to the top. What happens when one makes it to the top, the other crabs pull it, mm-hmm. that crab back in. Mm-hmm. I don't know what the reason is. Uh, some people say that the other crabs really don't want the crab to escape because they're still going to be stuck in the bucket. Or um, maybe they're trying to pull him down so they can climb over him. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I'd like to think of the... Pre- I prefer the first reason. And that's how, very much how it is in South Africa. People just trying to stop other people from succeeding. And um, while it's very competitive year in the expat community of a mm-hmm. year, people generally want to support each other yeah. to help them succeed. Mm-hmm. Because it's when we get to Hollywood, you know, that's when... You know, you become super competitive. So but that, year, yeah. but year, it's very important for us to help each other mm. and to, to get to that point. Because I wouldn't be. <laughs> I'm saying this like I'm like I'm somebody. Uh, you know, maybe actually, yeah, Why yeah. I tell everybody. Uh, I, I, you know, I think I'm somebody here, and um, I wouldn't be somebody here were not for the other somebodies that helped me get here. And likewise, you know, yeah, I've I, helped a lot of people. And a lot of people have helped me. You've interviewed a lot of people on the show that I've worked with in the past. Yeah, that's, you know? that's right. And you know, I <laughs> and I think that's um, not an understatement at all. I mean, um, I think every 
person that I've met so far, like definitely yourself as well, mm -hmm. definitely making a, a contribution and in a, in a, in a making a difference in the community as well. And I think that's a really important thing because when you see the, I, I keep you know noticing you know the Korean community and the expat community is somewhat divided and stuff, and all the people are trying to go into that bucket. Things are changing. Yeah. Things, are, things 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 are changing. Things yeah. are really really changing, and that's. Um, I can I, I can support what I've said by you know just using the feature film that I'm currently completing with Sunny mm -hmm. um, as an example um, because you know Amis mm -hmm. um, we're currently editing the film we've had a lot of post production delays we're going to be launching an Indiegogo campaign today at about midnight oh, wow. tonight yeah Indiegogo same um, we've put it, we've put together a a video for it we've put together. A, a, a lot of information about the film, quite a few behind the scenes videos, quite a few posters, quite a few production stills and everything for people to look at. And uh, we're going to be launching that today. But in the campaign, we speak about how the film was a very much a collaboration between foreigners and Koreans here. Mm. And we all needed each other to make this movie. Um, and when it comes out, I, I hope... I hope it gets a lot of publicity, and I hope that's one of the reasons why it gets a lot of publicity. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, things are changing. It, I'm, I don't want to knock my my home country too badly, too much. Sorry. I mean, it's it's where I'm from. You know, it's what made me part of who I am. You know, I felt most of my growing actually happened over here because when I came here, I became independent yeah. and I started creating for myself. I was always creating for myself, but I was always depending on other people. You know, but when I came here. Mm -hmm. I wasn't. I didn't. I wasn't in the constraints of a of a, of a university environment, you know. Um, and I came here immediately after I graduated. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I thought I was the only person who wanted to make films in Korea, you know. And eventually, about three months into my trip, um, I uh, discovered the Soul Filmmakers Workshop, mm -hmm. and then I, that's where I met Sunny and uh, Nick Calder, um, or Nick Neon now. Uh, Paul. Uh, oh, she's Khalid. doing pretty good now. He's out in the UK. Just yeah, he's doing pretty good. Spreading the filmmaker workshop he's doing, too. He's, he's doing well. He started the London Filmmakers Workshop. Really proud of him. Right yeah, on. we've we collaborated so many times. He was in the first film I made here, second film, the third. Yeah, the third film, and he even helped out as a consultant producer on this. So, um, you know, good for him. We we chat every week, so we keep tabs on each other. Right. Yeah. On. So, uh, what was the? Um, how much of a difference do you think you, you've changed from the first film that you made in Korea to the one that you're working on now? Because that's... How totally much, changed. How, what was, so. how, how long ago was the first one? First film I made in Korea was about nine months into my stay here. You know, I first had to get my bearings. You right, know. So how, how long have you been in Korea for? I've been now? in Korea for two years. It's quite a long story, but I can go into it. But I mean, that's, that's pretty a significant amount of stuff that you've done within the past yeah, two years. Yeah, I've done one, two, three... To the four, dull, four, sh dug it dug four short films, and yeah. uh, we'll have completed my first uh, feature film mm. um, with with Sunny uh, this year. So yeah, I'm I'm very proud of it. You know, um, again, I thought I was the only person who, I, who wanted to do this, and then I came here and I realized, oh my God, this whole group of people who want to make films in Korea, and then I realized that some of these people just like me actually came to Korea to make movies because that's why I came to Korea. Mm. I didn't come to Korea for lack of a better alternative. I came because I was disappointed with the, uh, I guess, lazy atmosphere back home. I mean, South Africa is a, a beautiful country with a lot of tech, uh, uh, technical know-how people and you know, a couple of directors here and there. But uh, I guess um, film producers and uh, distribution companies there, they really um, don't take advantage or, or haven't learned that the art of filmmaking lies in genre storytelling, you know, and back home, everyone's stuck about making films about the past. So what do you mean by genre s storytelling? Horror movie, a sci-fi movie, mm -hmm. a road movie, a mm -hmm. comedy, you know, these kind of movies. The, re the reason why America has and always will be making the best films in the world, mm -hmm. you know, and I strongly support that. Mm -hmm. Um... Because, you know, they, they have different genres and different genres appeal to different people, you know, but you can have one genre, which is what <laughs> the South African film industry does. And the, the South Africans try to claim, like, District 9 is our movie. It's not, it's not our movie. It's a Canadian film. 
you know, it happens to have a, <laughs> an expat South African living in, in Canada who made the film. And yes, it's got a strong South African story to it, but it's Canadian. It's a Canadian film. A uh, South African filmmaker who's Canadian now. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's all well, the posters done in Canada. You know, it's shot in South Africa. Oh, what did you think of this? Tonight? I thought it was a masterpiece. It was great. It was absolutely brilliant. Yeah. yeah. It was a beautiful for my grandfather who passed away last year, but he lived in District 6. Now, the story of District 9 is, is I mean, they just flipped the number around, really. You know, but District Six, it was a community of colored people, um, mm-hmm. which is what I would be considered as back home as, during the days of apartheid. It would be my racial category. Really? Uh, yeah. Uh, I just prefer to say mixed or mm-hmm. you know whatever. Um, he lived there, and uh, you know when the white apartheid government came in, it just forced everyone out. They forced everyone out. They uh, place them in different uh, locations and they bulldoze everything. They just bulldoze the entire neighborhood. Wow. And they did nothing with it. They just wanted the colored people away from the heart of the city, you know, because that was white man's territory at the time. I, I heard, I've seen this video apparently where like uh, people in South Africa, they actually, uh, uh, you know, theft is kind of like a constant issue. So they have like these high tech um, upgrades on their cars mm-hmm. where like it, like, had like blow torches on the side of the car mm-hmm. like and it's like it's like poosh, it's like massive and stuff like so when people try to come in and get their car like they have these torches that flame out on the sides of the car Jesus have you seen that I think you know more about my country than I do um <laughs> no no I haven't seen that right now I'm more concerned about whether Nelson Mandela is gonna live or die you know because that's he's inevitable he's, right like it's gonna happen he's sick at so. the moment the problem is is that we always cling on to him he's our he's our golden boy he's our hope he gave us mm-hmm. well he with a lot of other people but he represents you know the freedom that we as South Africa achieved in 1994 when he dies it's like it's the death of a symbol it's the death of our identity mm-hmm. in a way mm-hmm. in a way you know and it's not it's not the death of the rainbow nation but it's the death of the symbol that we associate our identity with you know but I guess that's kind of like Dark Knight Rises you know mm. because from that point on are, are there not any anyone which else which was the best movie of last year and, <laughs> <laughs> and which I uh, strongly consider the greatest movie ever made really yeah why? Why the the the, the best movie ever made? Why? Well, you know, it's, it's always goes between that and The Dark Knight, but they're two completely different films. Mm-hmm. One's a crime drama, one's a war movie. Um, but The Dark Knight Rises is essentially Bruce Wayne's story. It's mm-hmm. totally his story, and he is my hero. Mm-hmm. You know, I <laughs> when I talk about Batman or Bruce Wayne, and I've I've loved I've loved the Cape Crusader since I was about six. Um, mm-hmm. But I talk about him as if he's a living person. And people say, eh, he's, he's, he's just a comic book character. And if you tell me that on Facebook, I'll probably block you as a friend. Right. And, and you'll I, never I, know. I, and yeah, yeah, because I've, 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 I'm quite ruthless. <coughs> that. Um, just defriended a buddy who didn't like Bruce Wayne. Well, I, not fucking around here, this, folks. This too, I, I will defriend someone for two reasons. Uh, either they um, insult the Dark Knight. Um, you can insult Batman and Robin, you know, you can insult anything that Joel Schumacher made, you know, that's okay, mm-hmm. but you know, either they insult the integrity of the character, mm-hmm. you know, and, 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 ins- and say like, you know, Tony Stark's better than Iron Man because he's, I mean, Tony Stark's better than Bruce Wayne because he's funnier and has a sense of humor and all that kind of crap, you know. Yeah, you're gone. Or if you post Bruno, Bruno Mars, and I don't care if it's on my wall in my news feed, you're gone. Bruno Mars. That's the worst thing to ever happen to pop music, or music in general, um... Yeah. Really, Bruno Mars? Yes, yeah, just sickening. What, what, what's, what, what's with Bruno Mars? Uh, it's, his music is, is is trash. His image is trash. His sound, <laughs> yeah. is trash. everything is trash. You know, I, if if I'm at the gym, okay, and um, I'm say say I'm lifting like ninety kgs, and Bruno Mars starts playing, I have to like add another. 20 kgs to the bar. You immediately so, so, start so, to lose power, right? It's like yeah, a kryptonite or something? No, no, no. no. I, I, I have to add weight and I have to lift, it, lift a heavier weight. That makes you actually more motivated. Yeah, because, because, because I'm you, angry. Yeah, because you need... Bruno Mars makes me angry. So in a way, in a way, it's good. But, you know, if I bugger up my arms, it's, it's not good, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, it's either that or leave the gym. Sometimes, some people just want to see the world burn. You know, you know? Bruno Mars makes uh, Justin Bieber seem Grammy-worthy. I'm not kidding. Okay. He's that bad, yeah, as far as I'm concerned. And, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not going to go and knock Justin Bieber too hard. Yes, I don't think he's made great music, but I do think he's very talented. Mm-hmm. You know, 
Yeah, he's, he's a very talented person, and that, that's another thing about crab in a bucket syndrome. You know, he's a young kid who's succeeding. People are, uh, you know, twice his age, like, no, fuck that kid. Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. look at him, look at me. I'm gonna blog about how terrible he is, mm-hmm. and yeah, you know, and everyone shares this kind of uh, mentality, you know, and then. Look what it's doing to him. I don't think he's very happy at the moment. He's well, very scared to go outside. You know, he's yeah. shy of the paparazzi and everything. But you know what's really interesting yeah. about that is, like, if you think about the, the amount of access that we had to communicate with people, even to celebrities at all, you can, like, get their Twitter feed, you can get their Instagram, and you can actually direct contact them. And then if that's what people want. They want attention. Like, hey, you suck, man. You're, like, you're terrible. And then... If they say enough bad shit, they can contact them. Like, think about if you did that, like, 200 years ago, you know, if you're trying to, or, like, trying to, like, Twitter feed Napoleon, like, Napoleon, you're a piece of shit, suck by a cock, and then he's like, this bastard, this dead, he's gonna kill him at all, you know, it'd be completely different, you'd be fucking dead. Mm-hmm. Like, people have, you know, you know, everyone has their own opinions and stuff, it's really strong, but, you know, they're much more open and stuff, and that's mm-hmm. kind of a sacrifice you do if you want to be... Uh, popular or famous, but that's the problem. People want to aspire to be popular and famous for the yeah. sake of being yeah. famous and stuff. Like that's what Kim Kardashian did. That's what Paris Hilton did after they're she just, just started fucking they're on just, camera just, and stuff. Yeah. So they're it's just like this. You know, the society is that in in general because of the internet culture too, right? That's mm-hmm. what's the biggest influence in the world right now. Mm-hmm. Just that whole abundance of, of information, mm-hmm. and we're just like. Sharing but we we were talking why I think The Dark Knight Rises <laughs> is the best movie ever made. Yes. Um, just, I guess, you know, I, I, I can't say it's a fact that it's the best film ever made, but for me it is, you know, and what the film did for me. And uh, I think that's what well, more. Well, when Bruce that. Wayne climbs out of the cave in that movie, mm-hmm. okay, I thought that anything was possible. And let me tell you why. I used to lift, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a gym addict, and um, no, I'm not a muscle fool, but I'm a gym addict, right? Mm-hmm. And I go to the gym about six times a week. And I was lifting at the time about 60 kgs. And I was a bit scared to go a little higher. Mm-hmm. Came home from watching that film, which I saw nine times on the big screen. A couple of times at the Starium at Yongdungpo. I don't know why people rave about IMAX. Have you been to the Starium? The Starium, of course, oh yeah. God. It's like, it goes around your head. It's, it's, like, you just go around. You can't you see like... anything else around it. It's incredible. Anyway, so I decided I'm going to throw... Another 40 kgs under this bar. And I put the OST in my ears on this little the OST every time. I and I can select the track, Why Do We Fall? <laughs> and I waited for the music to bolt out. And I just lifted the bar and I, I lifted eight, man. And I was like, yeah, it's possible. The power of the human spirit. And that form for me embodies mm-hmm. uh, the, 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 the power. So, yeah. would you ever want to do a Batman film? Absolutely. Yes, it's my, my goal. Do you have any, you have any stories? I've written, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I've written, I've written quite a few. I've written a, I've written a treatment to a short film which actually uh, justifies why Batman would come to Seoul. Oh, perfect. And um, my, my goal like, is to... He's Asian! My, <laughs> <laughs> my goal is to... Um, it's, it's kind of... It's, it's got a bit of a Yakuza kind of clan story, mm-hmm. but they've been uh, banned from their own territory... Um, in Japan, so they come to Seoul to seek a, to seek asylum at one of the gangs here. Mm. But they were not before stirring up some shit in Gotham City, and um, Batman comes to Seoul to, you know, ensure that justice is done. Hanging out at Apgujang in Gangnam area. <laughs> well, you know, um, I got a meeting in Gangnam. I think it would be nice to put 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 Batman, put the Dark Knight into Subway. some of the no some of the dingy, some of the dingy communities when it's like raining, mm-hmm. you know, putting him in like Shillam or something like that with all yeah, those yeah. lights and putting him up there and you know there's so much shit going on over there and he's mm-hmm. trying to track somebody. Yeah, so I've 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 written the entire treatment to this thing, um, and um, it's not a it's not just purely an action packed Batman. I think what Nolan demonstrated with his films is how emotionally charged the comic book form can be. Absolutely. Um, and if you watch, you know, The Dark Knight, you know, you actually what, look look at The Dark Knight Rises. How much screen time does Batman have in that film? Very little. Yet it's the film that's most about Batman than any of the previous ones. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. Because like yeah. everyone's actions revolve around mm-hmm. him at the end. And the, again, it shows that Bruce Wayne is Batman. You know, so whether he's not in the mask, whether he's wearing the mask or not wearing the mask, he's still Batman. You know, no one else could be Batman but Bruce Wayne. And if someone else had 
tries to take over the mantle, well then, fuck them, you know? And what, 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 about, what do you think of jo- Joseph Gordon-Levitt? Well, I mean, he doesn't become Batman. He becomes a, a follower of the ideals of the Dark Knight, but he does not become Batman. <laughs> he will never be Batman, mm-hmm. you know? That's impossible. Um, so is that the same with, like, the Nelson Mandela person who comes no, out? No one else will ever be Nelson Mandela, no. yeah. But I think it's possible for one day for someone to embody his spirit in a way, but I don't think anyone has ever mm-hmm. since. So, so, so okay, okay. Joseph Gordon-Levitt um, <coughs> embodies the, 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 the ideals and spirit of Batman, but he's not Batman. He cannot be Batman, mm-hmm. you know? Just like someone else can embody the spirit of Nelson Mandela and the ideals that he stood for and stand for them again, but... You know, no one else can be uh, Nelson Mandela. I guess the best thing comes down it comes down to this: um, Batman can be anybody, but not anybody can be Batman. If that makes sense. You, you, hear, you hear that, Chris Angel? You can't be Jesus, okay? <laughs> you can never do it. No matter how many times you walk on water, you take out the nine of cards with someone's name on it out of your arm. Yeah. It's not gonna happen. So we have to bring into attention that you've got the Arkham Asylum figure over here. Yes. This is, this is pretty awesome. It's great. I've got the I've got the Batman from the Long Halloween. Do you know the graphic Ooh. novel series? Yeah, I do. I've I have it here. Yeah. yeah. You've, you've got the series. I've, I've read you know, so many we, of them. We, we, should probably, we should probably like compare graphic novels. Cause this is I've this is a, a Batman theme par- podcast I, today. It right? shouldn't be. It should be... No, you know, because I used to be uh, like the biggest be Superman theme, fan in, at, when I was young mm-hmm. and I think that was mainly because my brother was a huge Superman influence. So, I mean, you're totally excited for July then. This year, uh, yeah, I, I am. I mean, are, like, are I you are you cautiously I, optimistic about the movie about Man of Steel? When I see him, you know, he has a beard. I'm like, anything is possible. Like, I don't know how he shaves, but like, that's gonna be pretty amazing. When they have that one scene, he's just shaving, and he's just like, I can't use like a Gillette, or dude, dude. they're gonna do like you know like a promo. He's just like <laughs> titanium <laughs> Gillette, like adamantium, you know, just like put Look, that all over his face. I think it's stuff. gonna be the best Superman film ever made, simply because of the players involved. Yeah. Zack Snyder, visionary, Christopher mm-hmm. Nolan, storyteller, you know, yeah. David S. Goya, writing with Nolan. Goya is amazing. Oh, absolutely, yeah. right? Have you seen his film? Was it The Invisibles? No, I didn't see it. I didn't see the that film. Was, that was actually pretty was it, good, though. Was yeah, bit... I was really impressed with that. Um, but what I'm saying, when I saw that trailer, and I'm watching it, and then I saw, you know when you see that shot at the bottom where you just see his feet and the, and the coat mm-hmm. kind of uh, swaying in the air? I orgasm, man. Then you pulled your pants back up and put the popcorn on top of the penis. Yes, like yeah. exactly. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then I blew another load when yeah. you started flying. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm I'm so excited. I mean, you, you've got you got Nolan writing with Goyer. You got Zack Snyder directing. You got Hans Zimmer doing the score. Mm-hmm. Right. You've got some of the greatest. You got Michael Shannon as the villain. Michael Shannon is. Have you seen Take Shelter? Yeah. Have you seen Revolutionary Road? Mm-hmm. He's amazing. He's a brilliant actor. You He's know? great in. Yeah. Um, what, what is that? Boardwalk Empire. Yes, exactly, right? He's great on that. Superb. Superb actor. Um, and uh, you got Amy Adams. You know, you, you, you just... It's just... All the players, all the cards have been put in place for mm-hmm. this to succeed, right? I don't think there's any way it can fit. But then... I, I, I said that about Prometheus, right? All right. Well, I mean, I... I, Prometheus was probably after The Dark Knight Rises was the film that I was most excited for last year mm-hmm. and while I do recognize that it's a visual masterpiece in, on many levels mm-hmm. as a story and that's what it's supposed to be you know Ridley Scott doesn't just tell visual masterpieces he tells stories mm-hmm. you know like Blade Runner you know uh, which I consider the greatest science fiction film ever made and I don't mm-hmm. think an argument can be made against that yeah I think there's so many issues that happen with Prometheus I mean like it was, I think like, it was just a badly written script and, and I, it had plot holes in it that were unforgivable you can forgive plot holes like that in a film like G.I. Joe which is predominantly an action film which I saw twice by the way because I thought it was that good um, of an action film I think the best toy movie I've ever seen but mm-hmm. there's a scene in Prometheus where well I just it's where I started giving up on the film you get the, the the mapping guy who throws these two scanners into the circular ship. I mean, you know, that's all it is. It's just like one cave, mm-hmm. you know. And that is sent to the ship, right, so that they can get a, a 3D layout of the, of, the, of, the, of the alien ship, right? Mm-hmm. And then these two guys get lost in the fucking cave. Mm-hmm. I mean, in, in the alien ship. Mm-hmm. That is impossible. They cannot get lost in the cave. It's in constant communication with the ship. Captain's watching the schematic. Mm-hmm. Everybody leaves. They forget about these two guys. No, it's impossible. 
that was an unforgivable glaring plot hole. Those are the kind of plot holes that exist in bad movies. Bad, not okay, bad movies. <laughs> Prometheus luckily had Michael Fassbender and uh, Numi Rapace, I think that's how you say it. Yeah, that's Rapace, my, one Rapace. of my favorite actors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And ha- luckily had them to save the film somewhat, which is why, you know, there were moments that I enjoyed within it from beginning to end, and while probably uh, be paying money to see the sequel if they do it right, but uh, the, the biggest mistake was hiring... I don't want to say the screenwriter's name in case he watches this and in case, you know... I, <laughs> but he knows you're already talking about him, so... I'll probably bad on Facebook, you know. Somebody but, say Prometheus. Um, th- that screenwriter was the biggest mistake they made. Mm-hmm. Because what they wanted to do was make a direct prequel to Alien. And then the studio said, hey, no, let's make an entirely new franchise, somewhat related to Alien, but we want to make sequels because we want to make more money. So they brought in this new screenwriter guy mm-hmm. who... Uh, worked on Lost. Um, and uh, that's what happened. And, oh, that's what, and look what happened to Lost, yeah, right. So, and they brought him on to try and take what was written in the original screenplay by John Spates and then uh, just change it a little bit so we can have sequels. Mm-hmm. And that's what happened. It became a... St- uh, the story became a stinking pile of shit. I think that's just yeah. what happens when you have a lot of executive producers and producers like, trying to change everything. This is the problem, that's- though. Ridley Scott has a power... In Hollywood, he has power. He he can he can veto whatever you say. So when he looked at that script, I think it's because he might be getting old. But what the no, f made that's... what the f made him greenlight that script and say that's okay? That's the one we're gonna go for. That's what I was confused about. Just like Stoker. Did you watch Stoker? Not yet. No. God, worst movie of the year so far. Everything's perfect in that film. Direction perfect. Acting perfect. Music perfect. Cinematography perfect. Editing perfect. Gosh. St- so much shit going for it. The trailer looked amazing. I was so looking forward to this. Mm-hmm. Had the worst story I've, you know, seen in a, in a film in a long time. Mm-hmm. It was a terrible screenplay. Mm-hmm. It story the story made no sense. It was like the story was like if David Lynch and Alfred Hitchcock had sex and had a child, but this child was retarded. I'm not. I don't want to. I mean, I hope I'm not going to get too any, late. Any, I said it. I said it. Anyway, said and this it. child was retarded. Um, and you know made very poor decisions growing up and died at a very young age Mm -hmm. because of the poor decisions it made. That's what what Stoker is. Stoker is the child. Mm -hmm. So, you know, visually, it's got everything going for it, performance-wise, directing-wise, but it's just a terrible, 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 terrible story. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in terms of stories, I mean, how do you usually develop your own work? Um, I always write my own stuff. And um, I I will not direct the film unless I think that it has... uh, powerful, memorable characters that people can relate to mm-hmm. um, within a very, uh, within an original, st- uh, within an original story, yeah. Mm-hmm. So what, what do you usually like, think makes a, a, a solid story then? What's um, the main important thing? Or what, 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 what do you think is the most important thing? And Stakes. Stakes? Yes. Stakes. I think stakes are the most important thing. Characters, characters that you care about that have obstacles that if, uh, they are unable to overcome those obstacles we feel in some way that we have failed, mm-hmm. you know, because we are following this character on their journey, mm-hmm. you know, so this character must overcome this obstacle. And uh, that's what it was for me. When, when, when Bruce Wayne, that's, again, to bring it back to The Dark Knight Rises, you know, mm-hmm. I'm going to relate everything to my favorite film, right? Sure. So that scene when Bane breaks his back in The Dark Knight Rises, I saw that film nine times. I closed my eyes mm-hmm. the first time. When he's beating the shit out of Batman, I close my eyes. Couldn't watch it. Mm-hmm. Couldn't watch it. It, w- it meant that much to me. It was like I'm an atheist, right? But I respect what Jesus did for everybody. You know, I love amazing, your work. Amazing, amazing character. Yeah, yeah. 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 So I can imagine when people watch The Passion of the Christ, which I didn't think was a very great film, but I, it meant a lot to certain people. Mm-hmm. Um, I can imagine how people would not have been able to look at certain parts of that film because the hero is being, you know, destroyed, crushed right. by the by evil, evil people. Mm-hmm. That was exactly what it was for me in The Dark Knight Rises, watching Batman being beaten to a pulp. You know, I, cu- I couldn't, I couldn't watch it, mm-hmm. you know. And um, I felt like I had failed Batman, you know. Mm-hmm. I, I wanted to do something. I wanted to get up and I wanted to help him. That's how, I that's how, deep, this that's how deeply engaged I was in the story. Mm-hmm. And uh, I want to make films like that, where mm-hmm. you feel the same way about the protagonists of my story. Uh, my stories and uh, the antagonists 
you hate them, but you fear them and you respect them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, what type of uh, genre films do you enjoy? Type of making and stuff. <laughs> Gosh, like, uh, does that does that always vary? drama? It, it, it goes between mystery, mystery drama, thriller, okay. mystery drama, thriller, something like that. But, I mean, I enjoy all genres, I guess. Mm -hmm. you know, I love. I, I you know, I'm, I'm writing uh, right now. With, uh, I'm writing. I'm co-writing a uh, script with uh, Alan Choi, who's the lead actor of A Miss, who's yep. my partner in Roll the Dice Pictures, mm -hmm. um, which is the production company that I am the CEO of. It's a registered company. You can find it online and we'll put it on the screen over there. Okay. <laughs> Marketing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's a comedy, you know. Oh, really? That's, uh, you know, uh, quite a uh, far... Walk away from the the genre that a miss inhabits, which is a drama and a, a mystery film and a, and a thriller. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, so what was it about? Well, roll the dice. Pictures. Oh, I'm sorry. Productions. Uh, oh, there we go. Oh, you can just click on there. Interesting. Popped up. I'm so happy. Sorry, you were saying. Uh, so what? What 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 was it about this upcoming story that you were working with Alan that made you interested about it? Because it is a comedy, you know. Like, yeah, it's, it's, although like you know, like you have your it's favorite. It's a genre. Well, let me it's a black comedy. It's a dark comedy, mm -hmm. you know. It, and uh, it's about an actor, a Korean actor in his late thirties. Mm -hmm. Let me rephrase that. It's about a Korean man in his late thirties who decides to pursue his lifelong dream of acting, and you know, drops his day job and everything. And uh, the woman he loves starts becoming tired of him because, you know, he's not making any money and uh, he's, she's, she's being very patient, but she really wants to get married to the guy. Mm -hmm. And um, his father is a widower and his father's always getting, pushing him as well, you know, get a stable job, get married. And all he wants to do is act. And he lands a role in an independent film and uh, he needs to cry in a scene, mm -hmm. and he can't cry. Mm -hmm. And the director says, if you don't cry, you will never work in this industry again, and they postpone the scene for a week. That week, his girlfriend wants to dump him, and his father, who's a widower, is coming to visit him, based on a lie that he told his father, saying that he's actually been engaged to this woman to get his father off his case. Mm -hmm. During that week, he has to save his career, he's got to save the woman he loves from leaving him, and he's got to make his father proud of him mm -hmm. for the career path that he's chosen. You know, all in one week. So there's quite a few stakes there. Mm -hmm. a human, it's, it's, a, it's a very real, humane story. You know, mm -hmm. there's no violence in it. There's no destruction in it. But it's a, for any artist on their own personal journey, they can relate to this. Absolutely. Yeah. You don't need. Yeah. Sometimes having your dream crushed is worse than death, man. If I had a, I can't Absolutely. think of any other path other than being a filmmaker. If I had to think. If somebody had to put a gun to me and said, you cannot be a filmmaker, and I knew 100% that this is true, I'd just say, oh yeah, pull the trigger then. Seriously, yeah. Well, we have him right here with the trigger, oh. so he's going to come on over. <laughs> <laughs> just this your grits to the bed. <laughs> Got an AK-47. <laughs> yeah, so this is actually your site over here. This mm -hmm. is um, the one page regarding a miss and mm -hmm. stuff. It has a synopsis and as well in Korean. Mm -hmm. The poster, which looks great, by the way. Thanks. <clears throat> yeah, and uh, we well, the, if you go down, there's the the, the character, two of the character posters. The rest will be we can, you can click on it. I don't enlarge it. Mm -hmm. um, this is Alan Cho. This by is the way. Alan. Yeah, and. Uh, the one next to it is Daniel Kennedy, who acted in my recent short film, The Empire, mm -hmm. which won at the Seoul uh, Shakespeare Company Filmmakers Challenge on Saturday. Mm -hmm. There's a, I think there's a page for it, yeah. Very cool, these are some great stills as well. Yeah, these stills will all be available in the Indiegogo campaign that's going to be released later as well. So uh, what, what is it like when uh, you're on set and you're working on a scene? I mean, how, what is your work style like? Um, very calm. Be very calm. Mm -hmm. um, make sure no that head we... simmer in the background to get people worked up? No, no, no. no. Everything's done beforehand. Mm -hmm. When we come, we shoot the scene. We know what to do. When I direct a film, I don't do much direction on set. 
Mm-hmm. I pretty much just say action and cut, and I do no more than two takes on one thing because I've rehearsed the scene down so well beforehand. I've given all my direction to my actors beforehand. Mm-hmm. They know what they need to do. If anything, when I direct a film, I do it through elicitation mm-hmm. and guidance, mm-hmm. but I don't tell them exactly what to do. I cast these people because they are perfect for the role. Mm-hmm. You know, when you cast somebody, you cast them for a reason. You don't cast them because you've got to tell them what to do all the time. You cast them because you don't know how to tell them what to do all the time. You right. cast them because you feel that they are right for this character and they're going to bring something to it. You know, they're going to. If you're going to tell them what to do all the time, get a robot. The robot will follow orders, but that would be pretty amazing. Yeah, Michael Fassbender, are you listening? <laughs> <laughs> um, but if if I'm giving a lot of direction on set and I'm doing more than four or five takes on something, unless it's a complicated shot where, well, there was one shot in the Empire. It's a two and a half minute long take that's very complex, and we took about two hours to get it and through six takes. But mm-hmm. everything had to be perfect in that shot. Was that the shooting scene? Did you see that? Yeah, I released it online. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that was. That was very well. And then, because I remember there was the one scene where as, as you're rotating, there was like the mirror on the side. Too. So we you had, had to, to be... You had to be very, very careful. Right. The funny thing about that scene um, is that uh, I couldn't be in the room for that. No one else could be in the room. I, I trusted my cinematographer, Daniel Svukala, who is amazing, by the way. Mm-hmm. He's going to win an Academy Award one day for his work. Mm-hmm. Um, and I trust my actors. Mm-hmm. But all right, I, know, I had to. I trusted them. I put, I cast them, which mm-hmm. means I already trusted them. I trusted Daniel, and I just left the room, and I just said, "Action!" and I waited. I heard the scene go on. I visualized what it might look like when I see it on on the on the screen later. And uh, even the on the first take, even though there were a few mistakes, I wasn't panicking because, like, I mean, just lip refining. That's pretty good already, you know. Yeah. Let's just do it. One or two more. We ended up doing about five, five or six, and I uh, ended up using, I think, the second last one. Um, you know, it was it was complex. It was definitely my best idea as a director so far. And uh, again, I could not have pulled it off were it not for my amazing cast and crew. Mm-hmm. You know, and so when, when you were, when you were working on the Empire, I mean, it's actually uh, as you were like an in- reinterpretation. Of- it's a reinterpretation of us. Uh, Act one, scene two of Richard the Third. And yeah. so, how did you approach that in terms of reinterpreting it into a new? Scene? When Lindsay came to me last year, because we worked together on Falling. <coughs> Falling is my second film. It's about a thirty-five minute short film mm-hmm. here. Um, she gave an amazing performance in that. Yeah, when she was, she was, yeah. When um, Lindsay asked me to do this, thing, I said, "Okay, look, if I'm going to do it, it's going to be my movie. It's not going to be Shakespeare's movie. I'm going to." Take the story of Shakespeare, but I'm going to make it my own. Meaning, uh, the language is going to change, it's going to be modernized. Personally, a lot of people think the, the language is still relevant. The stories will always be relevant. They're timeless, but the language is irrelevant. It's gone. It's done. Nobody speaks like that anymore. If nobody speaks like that anymore, the language is relevant, right? <laughs> you can't make a film set in the 21st century where people are talking like that. I'm not going to go watch it. Even Josh Whedon's new film, Much Ado About Nothing, yeah, it looks good, but it's set in modern times, and people are talking like that. I cannot believe this. If I cannot believe it, even if, if it's like a fantasy film like Lord of the Rings, they created a universe that I could believe in, you know. But what if it was like stylized like in the Roman Juliet one? Oh, but that's a terrible movie. No. Oh, I hate Baz Luhrmann. But that was a great one oh, by I Baz Luhrmann. I hate it. I, hate, I, hate, I, I think I dislike all these films. I, I did not like Moulin Rouge. I did not like... Uh, I, d- I don't like Moulin Rouge. I don't have... Oh, like, well, an guys on like... Cons- he directs like on LSD, you know. What's wrong with LSD? See, don't crack it if you didn't try it, bro. If you take it on an LSD and you watch it again, I you're should, like, this is amazing. I should totally try heroin then. Yeah. Um, heroin, then watch Trainspotting on heroin. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think Pulp Fiction would be a more appropriate film to watch on heroin. But, I, but I'd snort it first. I would snort or heroin, yeah. Um, what were we were talking about? We were talking about the reinterpretation of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I told her, you know... Um, I'm going to take the same characters, mm-hmm. you know, I'm going to maybe add one or two, um, and I'm going to change everything. Uh, usually, in Shakespeare's plays, they're very male-dominated, but Vampire is a very female-dominated film. Mm-hmm. Female has the power at the end, you know. She has the man by the balls, and that's what I wanted to have, you mm-hmm. know, in this film. I'm, 
I don't know what it's about me, but I like it when my female protagonists really stand, or even antagonists, when they really stand out above the male, their, their male counterparts. Um, because I think without women, men are nothing. And uh, I really want to explore this in all my films. Yeah, you're, you're like, men rule the world, but women control the men. Yeah, so who rules the world? Yes. Women. Mother Nature. Gaia. Yeah, yeah doing that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and I was very happy with the reception it got. I was very happy with the two awards the film won mm -hmm. uh, on the night. Um, first thing I really ever win for anything. Mm -hmm. And I'm definitely going to send the film out to some festivals. Yeah. So you're looking forward to it? What do you mean looking forward to it? Well, looking forward to like moving, spreading the word. and because it, Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. It, okay, it's one of those things. Like it, it, it's, it's a really big significant change and at this point you're like well maybe 10 years from now it might seem like a little thing but it's really important it's like the first time when you make a film the first time you produce something independently and, you know passionately on yourself um, if you look at it now you're like wow it's kind of uh, like kind of hurts but when you do it the first time at that time you feel really proud about doing that kind yeah of you've thing. got to put it all in perspective and remain yeah. positive being positive is the most important thing as being as an artist you have to be positive Everyone's got this like idea that an artist needs to be like this cynical person with his middle finger to the sky, very skinny, wearing his boxes and a, and a, and a, and a vest in an, in an apartment, drinking a glass of whiskey, smoking a cigarette with his idols framed on the wall above him. You know, I think I know that guy. You know, he's, oh. he's the community. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's the complete opposite. Yeah, that is what a, a, rom a romanticized artist looks like in a movie, and we make movies about them. You know, but. Right. We uh, need to be positive, need to look after our bodies, look after our health, have peace of mind, be able to engage in loving relationships with people. Um, we need to uh, have meaningful goals, you know, and I'm pretty much quoting The Psychology of Achievement, which is a, uh, a book by Brian Tracy. Mm -hmm. um, I have the audio book and I listen to it whenever I run at the gym because I do a 5K run every day at the gym in the morning. You monster. And I, I, I listen to it. And when you listen to an audio tape, when you listen to music or anything, when you're running, you listen to it almost untethered, mm -hmm. you know, because your focus is so strong right. on that. So it's literally entering your subconscious. It's like listening to music or, 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 or an audio tape when you sleep. Mm -hmm. That's going to influence your dreams, mm -hmm. right? Just like music and an audio tape that you listen to influences how fast and how fast. Uh, how far you can run for well it, yeah, and it's also like a mm. like an anchoring technique mm -hmm. you know for example um, usually there's some people if every time something positive happens to them they'll do something significant they'll be like yeah, yeah. doing this this type of action so even if you're not in that particular situation of a positive emotion if you can do this technique and it, it uh, brings back those you know those energies or those uh, yeah. you know that feeling which is, which, which is why I don't want I don't want to knock uh, you know South Africa or, or Cape Town too much. Yes, there's, there's a film community there. And there's a lot of filmmakers there that I grew up with that I respect immensely, mm -hmm. that are going places. Mm -hmm. um, I just don't think it's a very tight community over there. And I think everybody, like I said, has a, has a, very, a, lot, of crab in a, a lot, of, lot of crabs in buckets over there. No they monkeys wanna, in a barrel. Just they want to the pull everyone else down. And I, I, I wish that the investors who, who put money into films there, mm -hmm. you know, so, recognize genre filmmaking as the way forward you know otherwise it's, it's not going to progress and actually you know I mean the next question is hey, why don't you go and change things over there right yeah, that's, I, I, I plan to, to go home eventually and uh, make a film back home mm -hmm. I've got a couple of ideas I've got a sci-fi film um, District no, 10 no, 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 no nothing to do with District 10 but yeah about alien invasion but in Cape Town not in Johannesburg because District 9 is in Johannesburg mm -hmm. Um, and I've got a zombie film, which I want to make in Cape Town as well. Um, and then I've got a road movie in inspired by Terence Malick's Badlands that I want to make in, in Cape Town as well, and well, all over South Africa. But I mean, those are genre films, you know. People want to go, what do you want to watch? I want to watch an action. I want to watch a romance. I, I want to watch a, a drama. I want to watch a horror. Okay. I mean, if, if, if we, if we... If, if, if South Africa blocked the films from the rest of the world like China did, well, China doesn't really do that, but in some cases they do, and uh, they only allow the population to watch the films that are produced by 
their country, locally produced films. Mm-hmm. What do you want to watch today? Oh, I want to watch that movie about apartheid. Propaganda. <laughs> <laughs> well, not really propaganda. It's just like I. Uh, it's well, North Korea has something like that. Yeah. I, I want. I want to watch that movie about. You know, ever since the Rainbow Nation came into play, the movies have been, they must have a white guy, a black guy, and a colored guy. They just like each other, and then they like each other at the end, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Even in, uh, it wasn't a South African movie. It was Clint Eastwood's movie, Invictus, where Morgan Freeman played Mandela. Mm-hmm. But at the beginning of the film, the white security guards and the black security guards hate each other, and then South Africa wins the World Cup, and they're like, <laughs> hey, let's just put our differences aside, eh? Uh, okay, yeah. that was great. <laughs> you know, but but, but a, a lot of the films there are, are like this. Or they're just like about AIDS. <laughs> that, that must so, be a genre film. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Genre what film. do you want to watch? I want to watch, I want to watch the post-apartheid movie. Uh, I want to watch the AIDS movie. So uh, I, I, I guess all their films, that's why, because of all the, the shit that's going on, it has to be a social commentary. Yeah, it film. always has to be a social commentary. Yeah, exactly. And while, I mean, look at The Dark Knight, though. The Dark Knight is a social commentary on the human condition. But right? it, it's also very specific to the American, of what's happening. I think, it's, like, I think it's specific to the world, man. Because I, it does yeah, affect yeah. the world, too, yeah. right? Because when it talks about, like, uh, World Trade, not World Trade Center, rather, but, like, uh, all the problems that were happening mm-hmm. with all the people, the 99%, the 1% or some mm-hmm. stuff. Coincidentally, that was happening while they're developing the mm-hmm. film in the store. So when people say that, oh, my God, this is exactly what we're going mm-hmm. in, it resonated even before it was mm-hmm. coming out and stuff. Yeah, and I, and I guess like in something like South Africa, like something that resonates with the community in that place has to affect them first before it can mm. affect everyone. So, like, again, you know. again, not a bad thing, right? Of course but not. I, like, they I, have to get through they, that They shit. have yes. to, the, the film industry back home where I'm from has to start moving on. And I think they are. I think there are films that are being made right now in South Africa mm-hmm. that, you know, that are genre films, but they're not in the spotlight, mm-hmm. you know, when we, when we when when people market the South African film industry, when distributors back home market it to the world, they need to market genre films from South Africa, not social commentaries. So it can, yeah. that, that can also mean it's just a marketing issue, then, right? Yeah, because probably like they're the, very not very good at marketing um, their own. We're South Africa is not very good at marketing its own artists, mm-hmm. and there are so many amazing artists from South Africa. But I think at this point, like with what you're going to do uh, regarding with Indiegogo and stuff, the mm-hmm. social media marketing is a huge thing that can definitely help those people because then they can do oh, a lot that... more without getting help from the government mm-hmm. or like from producers that way mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and get the word out. Well, we, we, we hope to succeed with Indiegogo. The nice thing about, you know, we had a Kickstarter campaign before mm-hmm. and we raised about $4,000. <laughs> then Sunny and I joked the other day. When, when we're deciding how much we should set our, our, our goal to on the on the Indiegogo, and uh, he was like, he said a number, and I was like, really? Remember when we said we needed four thousand for the Kickstarter, and we actually needed like three times as much <laughs> for making the fall. Let's set a realistic goal this time. So we set a more realistic goal this time, um, and we think we can get it because our campaign's legit. It's a the movie's done. Mm-hmm. It's not like we people. When you when you when you when you give money to something that hasn't been made yet, you have to wonder like, are these people really gonna make it? You know, mm-hmm. it's, you're kind of like cautiously optimistic. But now the movie's done. Mm-hmm. We need the money to do the visual effects, to do the the coloring, to do the music, mm-hmm. to do the sound mixing, to mm-hmm. do the subtitles. You know, right. there are specific things that things that the money is required for now. But the film itself, we can edit the whole thing together mm-hmm. and we can show it to a public audience. And while it won't be polished, there'll be a story there with characters that you can relate to and everyone with their own narrative arc with a beginning, a middle, and an end. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, nice thing about the new trailer that we're going to release with, uh, with the Indiegogo campaign, well, it's not new, but it will have the Korean subtitles in it. I think that would make a, kind of a huge significance mm-hmm. to it as well. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, wait, <clears throat> what? why do you think there's not enough uh, sci-fi films in Korea. In Korea? Yeah. Why Why don't you think they don't make sci-fi films? Gosh. Why do you think? Because it's a very interesting question. It looks like you already have an answer to that. I'd like to hear well, your Well, I would like to hear yours because... I've never really, really thought about it. Because the only one I can think of is The Host. The Host isn't really a sci-fi film. But that's the only one I can think of. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It, 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 that was a blend of different genres in a way because that's why people had a love or hate about it. Because you see, Korea, Korea is a very conservative society. And while I love Korea very much, many people are repressed in, 
you know, and they want to break out and break free in a way mm -hmm. and, you know, voice their opinions, you know, and it's, it's, it's quite a frowned upon here and there, you know, especially by, yeah. you know, the government and that kind of thing. So and the films that are made here, mm -hmm. that's why they're very violent and sexed up and crazy and awesome, you know, mm -hmm. because it's people exercising their deepest, darkest fantasies, you know, yeah. they can't really do it. In public, so they're gonna do it in the medium of film. That's why everyone wants to be an actor in Korea, so they can yeah. just like yell whatever they want. Yeah, to Yeah, absolutely. Maybe mm -hmm. you know. Um, did you watch I Saw the Devil? Yeah. Agmoral Boata, as masterpiece, genre masterpiece. The revenge, as far as the revenge film goes, it was original. Mm -hmm. It had the two best performances of the year. Chemin 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 Chik, Lee Byung Han, both of them. That guy is a wild motherfucker. I cried tears at the end of the movie. Um, you know when Lee Byung Hun's just like just walking down the road and he's sobbing into his hands, and mm -hmm. the music's playing. Bum bum. The music was amazing. <laughs> bum bum bum. Ba -da -dum. And he's just crying, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and the camera just kind of like follows him, and then he stops, and the camera moves away from him and away from him. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's powerful stuff. But the whole film, was, yes, it, it follows that, you know that that cliche trait in a lot of revenge films in order to fight a monster you must become a monster mm -hmm. but but it does it very well it does it very very well but, yeah, yeah when he was talking about that film he, he said the exact same thing because in order to uh, be the devil you have to become the devil yeah that's why who is the devil in the film that's what they have that's what they have on the post they're looking at each other yeah. who's the devil really you know? the devil. Yeah. sometimes posters are really well done have you ever seen the poster for identity yeah, which I was disappointed. By. No, no, but <laughs> if you saw the the poster, it had the entire answers, the entire film already in the, there in the poster. Yeah, because it had like know. a hand, and it had five people figures on the hand itself. Oh, geez, I I forgot in the film. I know the kid did it at the end, and the and it was all in the guy's head, and that was just pissed me off. <laughs> 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 just it always has to happen oh, like that, right? It was oh like God. too meta. It goes, it was in oh, there. Yeah. It was like a film that wasn't made by Stephen King, but it, should, it probably was. It I was just like. Been. Oh, really? Oh, fuck. Yeah, it's, it was like in the village where the monsters are not real. Yeah. But, yeah, I, after, what, six cents, after, like, Unbreakable, it was like, eh, Unbreakable was amazing. Unbreakable it, yeah, was, was, his, was his up, best film, as far as I'm concerned. I know a lot of people will disagree, but I think Unbreakable is M. Night Shyamalan's best film. It's a comic book film. It's a superhero movie. Well, that's, your, that's your favorite type of genre, though. Do you right? mind if I just... But go on talking. Ugh. I got some hardcore ones and give to you. Huh? I, I, these are prescribed to me oh really yeah for those of you watching I had the LASIK or LASIK oh you had so, the LASIK yeah, yeah a month ago so those are L LSD based you can see everything with like multicolored are you referring to Looper yes yeah you know the the drug they have in right, Looper right, right? Yeah. yeah that was an interesting film that too. was an amazing film yeah the, um the Rhea Rian Johnson the director of that film you yeah. know you know what's really interesting about that film was it was uh uh, had an issue in China because in China, in terms of genre films, oh. they're not allowed to show time traveling films Why? because anything that shows any type of change in the past is illegal because you know all their history has significant you know structure has a oh, so line. This is kind so of like anything, showing the future in China or not anything in the, that changes or alters the past in any way is illegal because in terms of China and their history they don't want to say oh. this can be changed but because of Looper is a time traveling story based in the future oh. so that was controversial well, because well it's not necessarily in the past so I guess it's okay to put that and show that in China so <laughs> isn't that crazy like, no it's, 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 it's actually I, I'm not surprised <laughs> oh, but I mean, like, it's just like that, that mind frame of thinking, you know, just like, well, I guess it's in the future. I guess it's okay. Like everyone, every place has their own rules and stuff mm. regarding a put and thing. And then they had, it's so funny because even before the film comes up, they have to have like a, a really serious talk about, okay, guys, Bruce Willis coming out with a new film, Die Hard 4. Okay, that's fine. Put it in there, whatever. It's fucking up the rest of Russia or whatever. And then, then okay, Looper. Yeah, we got to talk about this. This is, uh time traveling. Ah, I don't know. You guys are uh, fucking up things, you know, you Young Mao, um, Young Chi, you know, all these guys, what's going on, dude, you know, it's just fucking shit up. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, uh, but if it can change a film like that, it can change, like, it, it, like, it does, it does affect them that from that point on, like, even guys in, I'm not really sure about the film community in China, but if they see a movie like that where, like, 
what maybe they couldn't even see Back to the Future. You know, maybe mm. that wasn't even loud. But they, <laughs> they they got like a bootleg. So copy how, wait, so how, so they don't play that film at all, or they edit it so that it doesn't have time travel? No, they probably don't play that film at all and stuff. So yeah, then they probably, but you know, China makes everything. They can just bootleg all that shit and stuff. You know, it's just like it's. My, most likely not in the theaters and stuff, but then we'll just like have it a bootleg version. Okay. That's why they have bootleg versions of things, right? Mm. Cause, because they want to get this shit, yeah, I'm going to get all that stuff. You, but you can watch it in Taiwan. And Taiwan's sort of like the spin off country of China, you know, the. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, the, when Chinese people got wise and, you know, saw the benefits of capitalism and democracy and all those kind of things. Mm-hmm. Um, because a lot of the Chinese films that I watch are from Taiwan. Mm. Um, and you call that a Chinese film, you wouldn't call it a Taiwanese film, even though it is from Taiwan. But uh, I've never really seen many, 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 many films that are Chinese mm-hmm. that actually came from China. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a few good ones. Oh, hello. Let me song just came here. Hi. We're just filming, so <laughs> move on. Uh, yeah, <laughs> there was a. Have you seen Infernal Affairs? Yeah, no, of course. Uh, which is the, the Departed's based on that, right? Yeah, but I thought that was. My, I didn't really like Departed. You didn't like the Departed? No. How can you not like the Departed? Because Be- you watched Infernal Affairs. Because I did, and I I love um, uh, Tony Leung. He's the fucking man. If you watch that and just his own take on it, like I love Martin Scorsese. He actually he, he Americanized it into his own version. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. I respect that. I was like, I saw it and stuff, but in terms of the the the, the Chinese way of how they were saying this whole story within that perspective of like you know the Chinese gangsters and all that kind of feeling that's what really affected it's like you know there was this whole type of um, uh, theme that was going on with like um, westernizing horror films like with The Ring and The Garage and stuff Uh and they said one of the biggest issues of doing that was because they had to Americanize those issues so uh, Sarah Michelle Gellar yeah you go to um, to uh, Japan and because of that it loses a lot of the substance and the, and the uh, context of it because oh. they're trying to add meaning to this story that r- rings really well in in Japan mm-hmm. so we know when you have these films they try to put it oh Americanized it oh boy Americanized it but if you just watch the film itself people sometimes they don't want to read the subtitles you know what you know, they just like fuck that well know? I'll probably feel the same way you did about The Departed uh, when I watch Spike Lee's version of Old Boy because I don't think anything's going to match up to Chuck John Wick's masterpiece film and uh, yeah. the, I know the film went through a bit of production hall at the beginning yeah and you know do you hear the thing where it's like okay he eats mad every day what is he going to eat uh, tacos he's going to eat tacos all the time you know it's like oh. really really um, you know, like, what are they going to do for that? McDonald's? Yeah. McDonald's every day? Like, exactly. Like, supersize me? And like, really? uh, cast members started changing. I, I think it's, it's 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 Josh Brolin and Shalto Copley now, but initially, they had, initially they had, like, Christian Bale, and that's when I was excited. He was and a they new had bad Will guy. Smith yeah, and they had, no, well... <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to knock Will Smith. I think he's an amazing actor. I see you've got I Am Legend up there. Yeah. Brilliant film as far as the performance goes. He carries that film from beginning to end. Um, but uh, I don't think he could have pulled this film off. You know, um, he's too likable. He's too nice. You need a protagonist who you can also hate in this movie, because in Old Boy you love and you hate the protagonist of the mm-hmm. film, um, and you sympathize with the villain of the film as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really admire Josh Brolin. I think he's great. I've even once said that he could be the next Batman, if you think about it. That he's got the jawline. He's got the voice. You know, mm-hmm. he's got the presence. Um, you know, actually, when they were do, doing development, you probably already know this, but when they were making development, and it was like Darren Aronofsky was wanted to do his version and stuff. He wanted, um, he wanted uh, Clint Eastwood. Clint Eastwood to play uh, Batman in uh, adaptation of Frank Miller's yeah. Dark Knight. Returns. Which I thought that, that's a pretty good idea. That would have been, been cool. Yeah, that would have been yeah. cool. Um, I still think Aronofsky is is a very good director to reboot yeah. Batman but it would be an R-rated version and it would be very risky too I'm very disappointed with the Wolverine I, I, I gave up on Wolverine a long time I ago. was excited for it when Darren Aronofsky was attached and then I saw the first poster for the film and I was like well it's, it's okay let's mm-hmm. see maybe they learned from their mistakes no they didn't mm-hmm. <laughs> they're just making a whole lot of new ones and I think the film is going to be a massive failure it really is. I mean, they're already doing so many sequels, but like people kind of gave up on the last one. Already. Yeah, but remember, this, this, this was supposed to like this. This film was supposed to be like uh, co- uh, how can I say a consolation to the the fans who were so disappointed with 
X Men Origins. So they made yeah. the Wolverine, and we were all excited for it because it was supposed to be the Wolverine film that we were all waiting for. You know, a gritty, realistic take. And uh, I saw the trailer; just absolute trash. It's but I think that's that's what happened with um, Ang Lee's Incredible Hulk when they saw that. It's like, what the fuck is this shit? Well, well, you know. But then when they did the remake with like Edward Norton, right? I was like, that's a good movie. It's really good. But at that point, I no don't dislike. Really... I don't dislike Ang Lee's Hulk. I thought it was better than the Incredible Hulk. I thought it was first. emotionally charged. It was emotionally charged. That's what he's Hulk known for, right? Was lacked any of that. Mm-hmm. You know, it rushed through things. I thought the the the, the final battle in the Incredible Hulk with those two CGI monsters was a fucking mess. You know, and I thought Hulk, because Hulk is about emotion. Think about it. It's about anger. It's about love. You know, mm-hmm. it's about all these emotions. What triggers him? Mm-hmm. And Ang Lee got it right. But people, the masses. The, stupid people in the world they want the popcorn action flick and yeah The Incredible Hulk succeeded it wasn't a terrible film I enjoyed several sections of it I didn't think overall it was great mm-hmm. um, but I thought Ang Lee's film was brilliant mm-hmm. yeah. I was engaged from beginning to end and I couldn't wait for a sequel and I thought Eric Bana was perfect and ben is good yeah. the, the problem with Hulk, Ang Lee's Hulk is that there wasn't really like a standout villain in the film but Nick Nolte yeah. yeah Nick Nolte was great though he was great you know um but again, I don't know what he what he was really. I don't really know what his motives were the whole time, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but I thought it was a very good performance, great performances from from everybody, you know. Mm-hmm. The scene where he's flying and jumping in the desert, and the, the helicopters, you know, start attacking him, and I just thought that scene was just amazing. Yeah, the music was great too. The mu- um, I didn't like the whole comic book when they split up the screen into like little sections you know that's a, we know it's a comic book movie you know it's a bit yeah it's a bit cliche yeah don't do that <laughs> maybe that's his only point of trying to relate to everybody going yeah. on there and stuff but that's I, I really like the film yeah, I'm one of the few people who really like the film yeah. mm. Mm. okay let me show you the the video the trailer from oh because it might be already done okay it's, it's yeah it's buffered Okay, so let's just check this out together and then see what it looks like here. Okay. Don't film me now. Konami. Don't you die on me, damn it. Keep me dropping. Intubate now. Cardiac arrest is in deep bill.
Yes, yes, I know. You would like to know how long. I'm afraid it's been nine years. If I, if, I, if I had time, I would play that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's definitely interesting. It's uh, definitely one of the best games uh, series of all time. You, you've played this game? From the, the very first one. And I mean, you've played the fifth one? This one is not out yet. So. You know, I, I remember, you know, because I used to be quite a gaming addict, mm -hmm. but eventually I just didn't have the time for it anymore. But, right. like, the last great game I played was, um, was Doom 3. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was a yeah. that was a real game changer, you know. Mm -hmm. The style and everything about it. That, that really took realism to a new level. Or started taking it to a new level with Doom Three, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, and obviously, you know, I played the the games I mean, we probably played the same day. We you played Dune two. Oh yeah. You played Warcraft two. Yes. Diablo one. But those uh, are the games that take a long time. You gotta like, sacrifice a good good portion of your life to those, are, those are the games I remember, so yeah. I mean that's I think that's the thing I really liked about doing games because, you know, I work in a in a gaming company so mm -hmm. um, it something like this you need like a huge big budget scale mm -hmm. you have to work with the story and you can extend no it that's I really that's story. why I really respect these kind of games you know oh, yeah, yeah, they, they, they take they take everything seriously they even uh, as a filmmaker a filmmaker can respect something like this because in yeah. a way it's a film it's a movie absolutely know? and, and right. it's just about like um, bringing the interaction in terms of the story mm -hmm. and stuff and then sometimes when, now when they can change the, the linear how things can branch off to different things based on your choices you actually feel more in control of what's happening you like, know? like this game yeah absolutely like think about it. if they like Arkham Asylum and Arkham City was a great game, but if they had one where like you would, it would change depending on your choices and stuff. You know, you would feel already a much more deeper connection with Batman and with the characters and everything involved because you're just like, shit, what do I gotta do now? Do I save Catwoman or do I kill Harley Quinn or something? Yeah, like yeah, that, I, I, you know? cause, okay, because I didn't play it, but I did watch the game. What do you call it? They, they make a movie. Uh, yeah, the cutscene. They cut the everything, game. everything, you know, including the gameplay. So some guy took the 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 video sections of the movie and he intercut it with the actual gameplay sequences of the movie. Recorded himself playing the game and he right. turned it into a movie. Right. Yeah. So Arkham said you can watch it online. You can watch the entire narrative of the of yeah. the game. And I've done that. You know, I've watched yeah. that and I thought it was gripping, absolutely gripping. Um, the the bits with Mister Freeze. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. Mister Freeze. You see, if I were ever to do a Batman movie, no, I'm going to do a Batman movie. When I do a Batman movie, Mr. Freeze, if I do, if I get to do more than one film, Mr. Freeze will be one of my villains. Who would you want to do, Mr. Freeze? Huh? Who would you want to play? Who would I want Mr. to play? God, right now? God, Michael Fassbender, eh? Fassbender? Yes. Mm, Michael Fassbender could play Mr. Freeze. Very good Mr. Freeze. Because he's one of the characters in Batman that... I always feel so sorry for her because he's not really a bad guy. He's just trying to save his wife, and he's been yeah. wronged by society, you know. And that's what makes a great villain. Too. Absolutely, one that you, one where it's difficult yeah. to decide who you like more. And it's just like two people with two, you know, opposing. Look at uh, Heat, which is the best movie of the 1990s, from as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. uh, who's the villain in that movie, really? You know, is it Robert De Niro? Is it Al Pacino? Because they're the lead characters of the film. Or is the villain the the circumstances mm -hmm. of the of the time they're living in? You know, there's no real villain in that movie. You know, there are bad people in it, but no real antagonist, no real protagonist. You know, right? Yeah. And that's the thing, and that's when you get those kind of situations where there's like that gray area, and then once they have to do those mm -hmm. bold actions mm -hmm. to like signify that something happens, like no matter what's going to happen, it's mm -hmm. going to like make a huge impact on the audience and mm -hmm. everyone involved. And Absolutely. Stuff. My favorite game growing up, though, um, in my teens, was Hitman 2 Silent Assassin. Yeah. Oh, God, I love that game so much. I the newest one, too. Yeah, but, I mean, I, I played Contracts after that. Mm -hmm. Terrible. I didn't like it at all. And then another, I played another one after that. I didn't like that either. It went to Silent Assassin. Even though, I mean, it wasn't advanced to, uh, as far as the graphics went, you know, the story, yeah. you know, I could relate to it. I really liked it from beginning mm -hmm. to end. It was interesting. It was suspenseful. There was mystery. I was really intrigued and I really wanted to know what happened next in the next level. 
And that's what a game would have to do for me, you know, just like a film. I want to know what would have to happen next, and would I play this game again? Mm -hmm. And if I didn't want to play it again, it was because it was bad, it was because it was too scary. It's like Clockwork Orange. Would you watch Clockwork Orange again and again and again? You'd watch it again, and again, and then you'd wait a few years, and then you'd watch it again, you know? Mm -hmm. You can't watch it the next day. You know, there's some people that can, you know? Somebody's got to do that. Someone's going to make Stanley Kubrick films into video games. Just, like, make a reinterpretation of, like, Clockwork Orange into a game. Or like oh, they're already the doing that, you know? They're already doing it with some games, like uh, The Godfather, Reservoir Dogs. Did you play The Godfather game? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You didn't like, like it? No, yeah, I liked it. I liked it. it. I, yeah. I liked it, but... It's I liked just... taking over the warehouses. That was fun. Yeah. yeah. Eventually, it became, like... Uh, routine, and you, you knew what to expect. You right, know, when you right. need to take over each warehouse, but it was fun. I yeah. liked it. I liked the music. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in, in the in the game, uh, yeah. you know. Yeah. Actually, uh, you know what's a really good game was uh, Ghostbusters. I didn't play it. And Dan Aykroyd, he actually made the script for that game. So he that was actually his interpretation of oh. Ghostbusters three. And he had Bill Murray, and he had you know. Bill Murray's not going to be in Ghostbusters three. But you read about it. No, uh, yeah. But in the game it. itself, that was his. Part three, and then when you see it, like it goes right after part two, mm -hmm. and stuff, and then it, you know he's just talking about all the stuff he wanted to do in the first one, but due to limited budget and stuff, he actually went out mm -hmm. do it in part three. Uh -huh. It's really interesting. So I think like something with games and stuff can actually be um, something that can help push the, well, the genre. I'd love to see a movie made. Now we talk. Let's talk about games to movies yeah. I'd love to see uh, s some games uh, turn into movies particularly like Baldur's Gate mm -hmm. I'd love to see a film adaptation of Baldur's Gate you played Baldur's Gate did you yeah, play Baldur's it's like Gate it's a san, san, what can I say fantasy yeah, fantasy yeah, yeah. game yeah. yeah I'd love to see a Diablo a, a movie version Diablo of Diablo would be good. they're gonna but, make but, a Metal Gear film but, but, but like a, a, a nice one a, a, a well done film you know not like the way they did Doom that was a Fucking horrendous. Or Double Dragon. I don't know or, yeah, you know. Hitman nearly got it right. Because it was cast well. It had good sequences. It was well acted. It was a terrible story. Mm -hmm. Get the story right. So make a story that people can relate to. And then take from the game the necessary elements. Be true to it. Mm -hmm. But remember, it's also it's not a video game. It's a movie. Yeah. So when they did that whole first person shooter thing in Doom, that works in the game. Does not work in the movie. We should do that at the ode, as an ode at the end, basically, which is just what it was, right? It was stupid. That's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. So, uh, I guess that's it then. You know, we've been going on for almost an hour and a half here. Um, I don't know if you if you if you do want to just check out uh, the trailer for a miss. On yeah, the, absolutely. Let's do that. Which, which if you scroll up, if you scroll up a little bit, um, there it is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's. Check let that out. buffer, eh? Oh, actually, well, never mind. You can bring it up on the... Oh, my bad. Oh. My bad. Let's do it again, oh. folks. Oh. I, I, I've, I've got a... Um, what do you call it? Punt, the film. Punt? What do you call it when... There's a word that you use when you expose something or you market something on a, on a radio show or on a, on a TV program. I don't know, man. I used to be on radio. I used to be I used to be a, a radio uh, kind of presenter at my university, and someone would say, "Hey, punt my show later," or something like that. Maybe it is punt. It probably is. Yeah, because well, let's, let's call it punting. Okay, we're punting now. All right. So, what are we gonna watch? Uh, we're gonna watch the uh, trailer uh, for a miss, which is the collaborative effort between myself and uh, William Sunnyside Sonbuchner. Uh We wrote the script together and we directed this film together and it will come out later this year. Cool. All right, here it is.
Looks good. <laughs> How about that? How about them apples, folks? Great. Okay. So uh, before we leave, can we let anyone else know about what's going on, where they can help out, or any upcoming events? And okay. Whatnot? Well, if you want to follow Amiss, um, you can go to facebook.com slash movie, or you can go to my uh, my page. Well, you might as well just bring it up, eh? Yeah, might as well, eh? Um, so, um, so that's the page over there, and obviously we have videos and you know photos and everything from the film. We'll we post updates quite regularly. Uh, we'll be posting the Indiegogo uh, campaign later, and um, you know uh, we've got about 646 followers at the moment. We're recently featured in Groove Magazine. You'll find out about all that stuff. Anything related to the film, anything and everything, will be put on the on the web. Uh, on the Facebook page. We have got a website. We're still working on polishing it, so I don't want to... But it's obviously, it's www.msmovie.com, but you don't have to go to that. Um, and uh, just hang tight and wait for the movie, I guess. If you want to donate your money to it, and it's always such a sensitive issue here among expects. Just uh, please bring We're trying to reach out to the world. So Chun ones only. <laughs> no big bills. Um, if you want to donate money to the film, you can uh, donate money to the Indiegogo campaign. Um, and uh, look out for that in a few hours. It's going to be hitting the web. Yeah, it'd be great to uh, make an event and just make mm. some... Uh, well, you know what would be nice? Even because I know not everyone can donate. I mean, I've ever been in situations where I couldn't donate, you know? But making noise but by sharing and on Facebook and Twitter makes all the difference man mm -hmm. yeah and donate is not really a big thing I don't think I mean it's not really asking a lot you know if someone if just a friend of yours can just even donate five bucks each yeah and uh, but, well, well, when, when, but makes... when you share what annoys me is people just share but you gotta share with some text attached you've gotta write something you can't just share right. something right, you right. know people don't really care about shared videos on Facebook people mm -hmm. care when somebody's made a little note at the top about why they've shared this video mm -hmm. oh, oh okay well, click on this somebody just share something <laughs> yeah. sharing oh, yeah. is for caring yeah. <clears throat> yeah so yeah that's uh, that's it for today's podcast thanks a lot Raul I really appreciate it that was a really good talk we had Thank a good you. talk we did have a I, good talk I enjoyed it I'm, uh, I'm a bigger fan of Batman now than I ever was I always was but uh, it's always good to meet another Batman alright Right on, on, right on, right on, right yeah. on. Yeah, so uh, maybe later on we're going to start comparing graphic novels and uh, <laughs> trading them with each other and stuff. So many, so many great stuff. We're going to be geeking out. You have no idea. And uh, yeah, so everyone, remember, just uh, check out our Facebook page, facebook.com backslash myartistjourney. You just hit like, and then you can get some new stuff going on. Uh, check out our website, artistjourney.org. I'm trying to put some meaningful posts in there, something more. That takes a little bit more effort that can last, you know, within over time rather than just putting something day by day so uh, yeah besides from that um, everyone have a great weekend and uh, support a miss support Raul's films Roll the Dice Pictures and uh, check them out and everyone that's it we're done thank you very much thank you bye 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 bye